Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Horticulture School webinar series. Uh, if you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom Gonzalez. I'm Manitoba Agriculture's uh, vegetable crop specialist and I'd like to welcome you to the third webinar in this year's Horticulture School webinar series. Just as a bit of background over the past number of years, uh, MAFRI uh, or Manitoba Agriculture uh, staff and uh, AFC and ACC staff have presented Horticulture Extension live in a uh, horticulture school event held in Portage. Uh, COVID-19 has caused uh, some restrictions though on uh, how we and our partners are able to provide extension information to hort industry uh, and growers. This year we opted to use the webinar format and today's uh, webinar, like I was saying, is the third in a series. Our first speaker, is Anthony Mentenko. Anthony is Manitoba Agriculture's fruit crop specialist and Anthony will be providing an update on Manitoba fruit crops 2020. Here's Anthony. Thanks Tom. Uh, so yeah I'm the provincial fruit crop specialist. Uh, one second. You see that now? Uh, so I'm the yes. provincial food crop specialist uh, with the primary ag branch out of Carmen. If you need to get a hold of me, that's my email address. So today I'm just going to kind of go over kind of how the some of the issues we've seen this season and from last season going into winter. So I'm going to talk about last fall's extreme moisture conditions and how they affected raspberry, sour cherry, Saskatoon strawberry. Um, just a brief discussion on some of the lower strawberry yields due to smaller berries, some of the reasons we think that might be occurring. And just touch on kind of the, some of the adjustments we've had to make in the industry due to the COVID-19 pandemic and end on Spotted and Drosophila, just a brief discussion on that. So as we all know, we had some extreme fall moisture to end off 2019, um, just continuous pre precipitation events throughout September to November. We had that October uh, snowstorm, um, you know, some places had up to two feet of snow, of wet snow. Um, and we, but through that whole period, we still had mild temperatures, even during that, through that snowstorm, I think it only got to maybe zero minus one, many places. And it was even when, when that snow melted, um, so we had a lot of moisture in the soil and then we had winter, um, kind of rather quickly end of November. So that October snowstorm definitely caused some damage. Um, this is a picture of the raspberry canes flattened down, all the broken close to the base. Um, of course, those will not produce next year or this year. So anyone who suffered that kind of damage definitely had a loss of yield for this year. And then we saw similar things in the fruit trees, especially uh, in sour cherry and an apple. And so not only are you losing branches, you're losing the fruit buds on those branches for the next season. So you're losing your yield for next season. Saskatoon seemed to, team seemed to um, manage through that snowstorm quite well. Uh, I think it's more kind of upright um, architecture, canopy, um, kind of prevented branches from being bent over and, and, and broken, even though for all the fruit trees, the biggest issue, because there was, they were still in full leaf. And so that just a lot of weight on those branches. 
to to break them off. So that was that was some problems there. And research has shown that, like at least with summer bearing raspberries, that they do not become fully dormant for winter with excessive fall moisture. Um, so they don't really shut down properly. So as a result, you get less winter hardiness and therefore greater winter injury. So you get damage to canes fruit buds. So this is kind of an example from this spring. Um, this is uh, the variety Nova, which normally gets has tip kill. That's quite common with Nova, but a third of the cane dieback is not. So it a lot more significant dieback. And of course you're losing a lot of your production in that dead part of the cane is gone. You will get a little more production from laterals below that point, but not as much as you normally would. So one of the things I'm recommending for growers using the biennial raspberry production system where you're mowing off alternative rows each year is maybe this year, don't mow down let everything come up just so it can rebuild its uh, reserves, root reserves to uh, just build up some energy for this coming winter and then restart your you know, mow down cycle next year. We're seeing similar winter dormancy issues also kind of in the June bearing strawberries definitely saw uh, more plant mortality and again, of course, in the sour cherries, depending on the variety, we're definitely seeing less flower buds and cherries overall in the sour cherries. Part of that is also due to, to damage from the branches being broken off, but I think there was also some winter injury as well. And this is a photo of rhubarb. Uh, rhubarb definitely was very late this year. Um, and then we got really warm, but even even overall, the plants were not as, I guess, full. Um, definitely more spindly stems, not as, our, our yields are definitely down in the rhubarb. And some of the apple cultivars definitely had some, the ones that are a little, maybe a little more sensitive um, for winter injury definitely had some issues. Um, and but we think maybe this is just due to the fact that we're so at such high soil moisture conditions going into winter. Uh, kind of a major issue for a lot of strawberry growers this year was that although they had okay flower set, the the berries were not very big. Um, looked like kind of tarnished plant bug damage. Um, however, we think it was more likely due to poor weather during pollination as opposed to plant bug damage. Um, so kind of the kind of three theories we have going on possible berry size. Uh, some of the factors we think that may play an issue. Uh, were dormancy issues with the wet falls we mentioned before. So it had a little more winter injury. It was very windy most of May and June during flowering for the June bearing strawberries. And we had hot daytime temperatures in June. So we had a little bit of, of drought stress going on as well. So just to touch on the dormancy issue again with the wet fall. Fruit buds potentially injured. Um, definitely had smaller flowers, and smaller flowers do equal smaller berries. Uh, we had that late frost as well in in spring. So for some growers, the I guess what you call the first blossom, which is the what we call the uh, kingberry blossom, uh, that was damaged. So there's a loss of kind of a large potentially large berry there, definitely played a factor. And we had unusual, very windy conditions in May and June, um, primarily from the kind of south, southeast um, and strong winds, you know, 70 to 
60 to 70 K winds. Um, and this had a twofold impact with, I think you probably saw some damage, not only to the flower structure, but also incomplete pollination by bees as they just couldn't get out to the flowers to do a full pollination, which means your berry would not have kind of full size and you get kind of more of that seedy end effect because of incomplete pollination. One possible kind of solution to this uh, would be to really increase the number of pollinators you have in the field. So if, you, if possible, local um, honeybee operator could put hives on or near your strawberry fields. They definitely could increase the amount of pollination going on that field, even in poor conditions and definitely will increase yield. And then kind of the third factor we're thinking may be an issue with berry size was in June, we were quite drought stressed. Even with irrigation time, sometimes the berries just do not size up. It's nothing beats a, you know, a good rain um, compared to irrigation. Um, so just less yield overall, and especially in that second picking, just the size just wasn't there. So definitely, I think overall, we're not just about done strawberry harvest right now, that yields definitely were below average. So moving on to kind of the COVID-19 pandemic impact on kind of you pick and pre-pick berry operations. So measures were put in place to protect staff and customers. Um, essentially, the biggest thing we had to, that growers had to pay attention to is maintain physical distancing, um, put up signage stating physical distancing and not to visit the farm if you're showing any symptoms of COVID-19 or you're in contact with someone who had tested positive for COVID-19. Kind of, you know, similar things you see when you go into a retail store. Um, so guidelines were developed by myself and the PFJ board, and I'd like to thank them very much for that the assistance to help growers kind of navigate through this and and keep us you know op operating as smooth as possible through this pandemic. So we had our guidelines that they're online at this website, um, kind of outlining various aspects of, of how to make your operation safe and just um, just various aspects of, of uh, what you needed to do. So berry farm operations were considered essential services like most ag businesses. So these guidelines were kind of developed to be applicable even if we were in a maximum lockdown in pandemic mode, which we were, you know, in the late winter there. Um, so this, the guidelines deal with safety of the owner, staff, and customers, and really the focus was on hygiene and traffic flow. So these are kind of the list of the guidelines developed on, and that's on that website. So kind of uh, Matiba Farm COVID guidelines overall for pre-prick, for you pick, uh, for uh, a farm worker, for customers, and just uh, uh, frequently asked questions. Um, so this really seemed to help give growers kind of a peace of mind of what they needed to do and how to, how to really protect themselves and their customers. So when we looked, I think just, um, we're just kind of finishing up a little bit, a lot of the harvesting for Saskatoon's strawberries, pass cap is done. Um, sour cherries is ongoing right now and raspberries are just kind of starting up. Um, but from the kind of early results here, definitely see a demand was greater for berries and supply, uh, even more than normal this year. And I, I think it's because of the pandemic, not only people wanted to kind of get out and do something, uh, but also I think there's definitely a more of a focus on wanting to get local food and especially local fruit kind of uh, 
stored away for winter in the freezer or uh, for canning or whatever. So um, most growers increase prices due to higher labor costs. Um, and this was really due to additional labor needed to maintain physical distancing, kind of tropic flow, even just sanitation on the berry farm. Um, and the Career Fruit Grower Association um, got an online website appointment system up and running this spring for you pick and prepick. So some of the operations, berry operations, switched to this appointment appointment only system to kind of control the amount of crowds coming to their farm. Which uh, there's I know some hiccups in that system, but it, um, definitely um the prairie Fruit association is going to make improvements on that if uh to make it even run smoother for next year and it's something that they're going to keep in for long term so i think looking to next year i think definitely there's potential for these guidelines to be in place again for the 2021 picking season i anticipate price increases across the board for all local fruit crops due to not only higher labor cost, but just the higher demand. Um, Cause I think historically local fruits have been just underpriced by growers. They're selling a premium product that really can't be bought in a retail setting. And they're selling at either re at retail price or just below retail price. So I think I almost look at this as a kind of a market correction where we're undervalued before. And I think we're approaching more where we need to be for, for growers. Okay, and then just to finish off my little section, we're gonna just talk about uh, spotted ring drosophila and just to give a really quick background. It's commonly confused with the common fruit fly, uh, but it's differ different than the common fruit fly in, in that it atta attacks unripe to ripe fruit. Uh, whereas the common fruit fly feeds on overripe and rotting fruit. So uh, it's very commonly found in raspberries, strawberries, uh, cherries, and was starting to see it more in Saskatoon's and Manitoba. So they are most active at 20 degrees Celsius. Their activity becomes reduced when you have you know, temperatures above 30 with lower humidity. Um, but when you get like, you know, mid 20s with high, you know, higher humidity or, or rain events, um, it definitely benefits their uh, population increase. The good thing is that, you know, the egg larvae and adults can die at temperatures below freezing or even in the, when you put it in the fridge, uh, refrigerator temperatures, their activity stops in the prairie. So this is just kind of a uh, larger image of, of what the spotted wing drosophila looks like. You can see the male with the spot on the wing and the female with no spot, but it's egg laying device, the ovipositor. It's very noticeable, has like almost uh, sawtooth um, edges on it. So it actually saws, kind of cuts into the ripening fruit and lays eggs. And you won't see that on with a common fruit fly. They don't have that kind of uh, legging device. And, and keep in mind, these are very small. Like these are, everyone I think knows what a fruit fly, how the size of that. So that's the same size as that. So quite small. And this is uh, the larva on strawberry. And again, very small, almost clear like, so very difficult to see. So about two to three millimeters. Typically you'll see soft spots on the bottom half of the berry. And you know, you can mistake in it for root rot or handling when, when the berry is too hot or something, but um, it, it can be uh, indication of spotted wing or soft lip damage. So, so this is kind of a more advanced example. You see the soft spot in the bottom half of the berry. And a lot of times people probably wouldn't even pick that just because it's so soft. So 
just kind of a summary of what we usually see on the various fruit crops in Manitoba. Um, definitely, it's I would say the biggest problem in raspberries. It's a major pest. Without controls, you probably only get half of your berry harvest off before the second half is really just not marketable. There's just too many larvae in it to to sell to anyone. Um, in strawberries, again, it's typically more of an issue with the late season varieties. Uh, so the later part of your harvest, like the last third, um, and in the day note strawberries as well, uh, without any kind of control, you definitely will see them come in. We see them, we had a later strawberry harvest this year. So probably we saw more of the harvest at risk this year, probably with the last half of that crop more at risk in strawberries than normal. Um, so it's definitely something growers needed to be aware of. And in dwarf sour cherry, it's usually ready typically mid-July. So it's usually around the time we see spotted wing numbers really start to increase. And it's an issue throughout harvest without control. And in Saskatoon's, has it been an issue really? We had it, I sure it was there, but it had it been in a, too much of a noticeable issue with growers. Um, till the last two years, we really noticed that the second half of the harvest without control definitely had some issues. So we had low number of, in, uh, in, of spotted ranger softland traps in early July. The numbers increased throughout July as more sources of food became available. So like from wild bush fruit or commercial berry fields. So then the numbers really started to increase and then we had favorable weather. So we really had a population spike. And again, as I mentioned before, we started, we've been seeing it more of an issue in Saskatoon in the past two years. And I'd say overall for all fruit crops, we need to probably tighten up our spray program from seven to 10 days to five to seven days. And it's important to constantly rotate every application uh, through different insecticide chemical groups to avoid potential resistant issues. So like spraying mate, mac oak or group three and alternate with delegated group five. Uh, and remember that berries are susceptible to spotted wing infestation from the time that it starts to change color to all the way through harvest. And if you wanna see uh, for updates and control options, you can visit this website. Um, larva and the fruit, I just, I just wanted to make this part of cake. So the larvae and the fruit make it unpeeling visually. However, it's safe to eat if it isn't a fruit and doesn't impart any unpleasant taste. Um, and fruit typically is very soft and so it's most often passed over for picking, but just so it's not, if, if you do have larva in your fruit and most fruit this time of year probably does, it's, it's okay to eat. It's just not, you just don't think about it. That's the thing. Uh, so here's just kind of like a, kind of a five pronged approach to dealing with spotted wing. You want to monitor for it. You want to harvest as frequent as possible, apply insecticides, alternating, uh, maybe avoid planting very late maturing varieties like in strawberries, keep raspberry rolls narrow to reduce the habitat for spotted wing and definitely cool berries immediately after harvest and that stops all spotted wing drosophila activity in the berry. Uh, so if you have any want more info on just commercial fruit production, production info, uh, visit the, this website. Uh, and if you have any questions, definitely send me an email um, and Definitely happy to answer any of your questions. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it for my talk. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I think the plan is we'll do questions at the end if I understood correctly. Uh, so we'll move on here to our next speaker. speaker sorry, is uh, Dr. Vikram Bish. Vikram is uh, Manitoba Agriculture's horticultural pathologist. Today, his presentation is Manitoba Fruit Crops Pest 2020 Update, basically. So here's Vikram. Okay, Vikram, I think you are muted. If you want to unmute yourself, there you go. 
Uh, still mute. There you go. Okay. Uh, I work for the Department of Agriculture, and I've been here since uh, 2010. It's about uh, 10, 11 years now. So today I will be giving an update on the fruit diseases or uh, some of the calls that I have had, and in some cases, how to manage them. Uh, Anthony talked about uh, the weather. I'll talk about it in a different way. Initially, our weather was cool and wet, and then suddenly it got hot and dry, and currently it is warm and moist. So the current conditions are not really good for uh, the diseases. They are very favorable. So more and more problems will start now. I just wanted to give you an idea that most of the calls that I got were for strawberries, some raspberries, apples, grapes. Uh, this year, I didn't get any calls for the sour cherries, but uh, there is an issue in some cases there too. Uh, because uh, it was uh, rather dry for the early part of the uh, season, the conditions were not favorable for the uh, leaf diseases, and so they were much, much lower. Uh, botrytis rots were also very low uh, so far, but now because of the wet conditions, the uh, condition for the botrytis is very, very favorable. Uh, because of the temperatures for over 30 degrees Celsius for many, many days, uh, for almost three weeks at a time, we have had uh, a lot of uh, verticillium wilt in at least one farm that I have visited. And uh, there's a fair amount of uh, wind damage as uh, Anthony had just uh, talked about. I'll talk about a few strawberry problems that uh, we have seen. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the angular leaf spot, the common leaf spot, the gray mold, anthracnose is an issue for some farms, and then verticillium wilt. The other diseases uh, will probably be another time. Okay, angular leaf spot is uh, very easy to recognize early in the season when it is uh, cool and wet, and you see some of these uh, shiny are you able to see my cursor? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. good. Yeah. So here you can see the wetness on the calyx, and in some cases on the leaves, you can see water soaked spots. So this is a very good uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tool to have it uh, to recognize the disease. The bacterium survives in the soil in crop debris, and so it is really important. Uh, not just for this disease, but for most of the diseases that after the crop is over, it is cleaned up. Uh, and uh, splashing rain, rainstorms, or over irrigation is a major problem to uh, have when you are having this disease in the uh, fields. There's no resistant variety, and the varieties differ in some level for their susceptibility. The other thing that many of you uh, growing strawberries will see is the common uh, eye, bird's eye leaf spot, also called frog eye by some people. It's very, very common. Uh, this level is not very uh, serious uh, problem, but sometimes when the leaves are 50% covered, there'll be a lot of defoliation, and that is the time that it becomes an issue for productivity. It overwinters as spores in the crop residue. Again, crop residue is a big problem. And it is favored by warm and moist conditions that we currently have now and spread by splashing rain. So if you have mulch, then it will splash a lot more compared to the hay mulch. So there may be a choice to make there. Uh, leaf spot management, again, uh, remove the old debris and if the old crop has 25% uh, leaves or less than that, then it is not a big issue. But if 25% or more of the old leaves have problems, then it is good to basically uh, renovate very properly. 
so that you don't have any residue left over. Protect uh, the new and young leaves, and especially when there is rain in the forecast. Spray fungicides on so that both leaf surfaces, upper and lower, are covered with the fungicide. And there are certain varieties which may have uh, some tolerance. So if you're growing this, it is good. But if you're not, maybe it's time to think of uh, changing your variety mix. There are a lot of fungicides that are available. Unfortunately, these fungicides also control a few other leaf diseases on the strawberries. So I'm not going to name all of them. Uh, you can probably go back uh, and access this uh, presentation and uh, get the list. Uh, so many of these are very commonly available. Uh, this is a problem that uh, is uh, called uh, the anthracnose, uh, very dark uh, spots on the uh, berries. And they start as light brown uh, and water soak lesions. And as they ripen, the fruits ripen, it becomes very dark and sort of leathery. And again, uh, the current conditions are very favorable. And <clears throat> again, here also, renovation after harvest is to remove the old infected crop residue. And if you have a you pick or uh, yourself as a grower, uh, don't throw the berries uh, between uh, the two rows because that is the source of inoculum. So anything which is partly rotten, not going to be used, must be taken out of the field. And that is probably a very good sanitary sanitation practice. There are certain fungicides available and they work very effectively. Uh, sorry. They work very effectively, uh, provided they are uh, sprayed in time and the disease pressure is not too high. For this photograph, I should uh, thank uh, Jeanette Gautier. And uh, I suppose she has this uh, at her farm. I hope we can work together to reduce the problem. This is uh, a problem, verticillium wilt, which is an issue when the crop is under drought stress. That is when you have uh, no water, the irrigation system is uh, <clears throat> uh, basically throwing the water, but most of it is evaporating. So the uh, field is rather dry. And in some cases that you can see here, the uh, hay mulch is uh, almost gone. So the plants is very, very stressed. So the heat, lack of water is going to really create a big issue. Very easy to recognize that the intervenal uh, chlorosis that is uh, yellowing or browning of the leaves is a very good sign that either the plant is under drought stress or it is infected with uh, uh, verticillium disease. There is no uh, chemical control, maybe fumigation, but that is in case the uh, problem is on very large patch in the fields. The disease will also affect uh, potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants. So if you have those crops uh, in, do not plant uh, strawberries in those patches if the disease is known to occur in those crops. This uh, fruit rot, uh, Botrytis fruit rot, I am sure most of you have seen it uh, quite often when we get uh, uh, berries from uh, California and they are marked at half uh, price. Uh, please be careful because uh, this uh, uh, spores of this uh, fungus are basically spread all over. This is one of the fruit trays from California, which was marked uh, probably at uh, half price, but when I brought it home, uh, it looked more beautiful than it was at uh, the store. More beautiful for a plant pathologist. Okay, here is a very good sporulation, supported by high humidity. So this is uh, the 2020 photographs. Here you can see at the bottom, the water soaking and then sporulation. This fruit is basically gone. Uh, just after a few rains uh, uh, last week, 
we are starting to see strawberries with so much correlation. And if you look at this, a slight uh, wind or uh, thunderstorms will be taking these spores all over the farm. And so <clears throat> most of these berries that are close by are going to be affected and will have a very poor shelf life. So from, from now on, if you're going to harvest, basically you want to uh, freeze them for milkshake rather than eating fresh. How do you manage? Uh, there are certain varieties which have more tolerance. I wouldn't call them very high resistant, but they are good. At the time of renovation, nitrogen can be applied. Avoid spring nitrogen because the young susceptible foliage will get infected. And uh, at the end of harvest, remove all the dead plant uh, and foliage. And uh, like leaf spot diseases, uh, we can use a lot of uh, fungicides. They're very nice and big choice. Here is a huge list of uh, fungicides. Uh, you want to go for biologicals. We have the actinovate, root shield, serenade max. And then we have chemical fungicides also available. These are uh, the uh, group which does not have specific, but it is a uh, wide spectrum and uh, does not develop resistance. These are other fungicides which have uh, specific uh, uh, respiration of the fungus in affected, but they will probably get resistance development in botrytis. There are certain fungicides which were available earlier registered, but now they have been taken off. So please make sure that you read the current uh, fungicide label before using anything. And uh, something exciting uh, that uh, we have uh, tried is a uh, fungus called glyocladium, and the perfect stage is called Clonostachys rosea. It's a natural soil borne fungus present in most soils. So, uh, this fungus has been used as a biological control in EU, in the US. They are working in Canada also. So, started to work in uh, this uh, field in uh, uh, Guelph, and I had uh, the fortune to work with one of the researchers, and this is what we do. So this is called a dispenser of uh, the biological control agent. When the bees come out, they get coated, their legs get coated with the powder that is kept in there, uh, and when they go in, there's no powder here. And so the bees are basically carrying the biological control to all the flowers that they visit. This is the concept. There's a concept drawing, or it is from a bumblebee experiment in a greenhouse that so the powder is here. The bees are coming out, bumblebees, and their legs are coated, you can see here. And <clears throat> We did an experiment in 2017, 2018, 19, and also doing it this year. You have the bees visiting these flowers, and we put a cage so the bees can't go in. And we compare if uh, the bees have gone to the flower or not been able to go to the flower and compare the difference in the uh, rotting of the fruit. And here is the difference when the uh, plants were treated or the flowers were treated because of the bee visit, you had many healthy uh, berries, 8% uh, botrytis rot. And when the plants were caged, they had 25% rot in the uh, berries. So they work very well. But if you elongate uh, the incubation or you keep the berries longer, of course, the uh, rotting will spread or become uh, fairly high. So this just gives a proof of concept that uh, the bee vectoring of this fungicide, uh, biocontrol fungicide is possible. We have had uh, some good success and the trial is being repeated. So this year <clears throat> we sprayed the biocontrol agent in plots which were marked two meter plots. And here is my summer student Phoebe who is harvesting the uh, berries from 
uh, within the marked plot and outside the marked plot. But here we have put the fungus, the biocontrol fungus directly, and we are comparing what the uh, control is with the biocontrol itself. <clears throat> and here uh, she has put these berries in egg cartons. And you can see here, the humidity is very high. We keep the berries here for about five to six days, and then we bring them out and look for the uh, rotting and score. So the results have not been tabulated yet, but we expect uh, to have uh, uh, good results. So here is one of the berries put in the egg carton and showing the uh, uh, infection of uh, the botrytis. Going on to the raspberries, uh, here the main problems are the fire blight, the cane blight, spur blight, the botrytis here also, and I'm sure these bees could be used for botrytis control, even for raspberries. <clears throat> there are other diseases that I will probably not talk about uh, this time. <clears throat> so, uh, Anthony had talked about uh, some of the winter kill, but here uh, you can differentiate that the top of these uh, 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 branches is having a very interesting hook. It's called the shepherd's hook, and the leaves are all showing, or many of those are showing this kind of blackening. This is because early in the morning there is a dew on these leaves, and the bacteria just uh, travel along the veins with the dew and then infect that area. Uh, and I have this uh, photograph here. The bees have done their job from uh, one plant to the other. These uh, during the mornings, these uh, bees will or the flies will pick up the bacteria. And when they are visiting the flowers, they are then infecting the flowers as well. Uh, this same bacteria affects the uh, apples, and here's the typical shepherd's hook on the uh, apples as well. So here, uh, I'm not sure uh, how to uh, put uh, fungicides or antibiotics on a large scale. Uh, the best thing is to uh, prune them and much further in towards the stem end so that you don't have problem for next year. So fire blight is the name because it uh, scorches the leaves and it appears burnt from a distance. Uh, it has a very wide host range. Cherries, apples, raspberries will all get infected. Warm and rainy weather, which we currently have, will spread the disease. Uh, hail causes injury and wind will carry the uh, inoculum far and wide and so we have uh, wind dispersal as well. And then you have the bees or flies, which will also take the disease all over. The control strategy is basically to prune. And one of the best things would be to prune anything that is old. After uh, your canes have uh, uh, produced, it is best to remove all the canes, have good airflow in them so you uh, remove most of the old uh, canes so that you have 15 maybe or 20 canes per meter uh, for some, uh, yeah. Uh, you can also, as a preventative measure, use biological bacteria. These are the double nickel or serenade. And these are not, uh, uh, you can say magic uh, bullets, but they will help reduce the uh, impact of the uh, fire blight uh, before infections actually appears on the plants. So it is best to put it prior to seeing the problem or the disease. Scout early. And if you had the problem in the previous uh, uh, season, then one should expect uh, that there will be problem again. However, the gusting uh, thunderstorms and rain can carry the inoculum far and wide. Uh, there is a good 
uh, antibiotic <clears throat> and uh, it fortunately has a one day uh, pre-harvest interval. I read the label wrong and I thought it was uh, 90 days for raspberries and one day for vegetables. Uh, my mistake to the grower whom I told to not use it because I read the label long. So it means one has to be very careful in reading the labels and uh, it is important to go for, uh, you know, a preventative. So this is a good product. Copper is also a very good product uh, to put on. Uh, however, copper and uh, its application is probably not going to solve uh, the disease that we already have, but it will reduce the spread. Uh, the antibiotic is going to be a good product. And at the end of the fruiting, prune out all the old floricanes because you don't want that for uh, the uh, uh, fire blight and you don't want it for the other disease that we will be talking about soon. Cusumin, this is the label and it has a one day uh, PHI for raspberries and it is acceptable to use on many different crops. Good product. And uh, there is resistance uh, available. So Nova and Royalty are resistant varieties. Boyn is super susceptible. And if you are using these two, they will also get the disease. Uh, one of the growers got uh, the variety called Killarney and was told that it is resistant. It is probably more tolerant than Boyn, but certainly it was not resistant. And here, uh, this is last week's uh, photograph from uh, one of the growers uh, uh, farm. And so, yes, the variety does get the disease. Okay, I'm coming now to the cane blight, which is an issue for some farms. And uh, this is a problem when the primo canes get uh, infected, either because of strong winds and uh, the problem is that uh, it is not visible early in the uh, infection stage. And then suddenly uh, the plants uh, develop uh, round cankers. And then these plants, uh, these canes become uh, brittle, dry, and they would basically dry out. Uh, so uh, it is important that uh, one check uh, the canes uh, early in the season, pre-budding, and uh, lime sulfur is a good product to use. And you can see here the uh, bush or the bushes are very thick. So it is important to reduce and uh, basically have a better airflow than what it is uh, showing in here. Uh, this is how the disease will look like lot of browning on this, you can see here. Then we have a, a disease called spur blight and the cane blight and the spur blight are often occurring together. This is the pycnidia that uh, develops on the canes and uh, it is the fruiting body under conditions that we currently have. There will be a lot of spores that will be moving around because of the wetness of the weather. There are a lot of fungicides available. So uh, there is a pre-harvest interval to look into uh, before you uh, go for application of some of these fungicides. This is the difference between the cane blight and the spur blight. Fortunately, some of these fungicides work on both diseases. And unfortunately, these diseases often occur together. So. Uh, good one way, but bad the other way. I got a call uh, early in this season that uh, the apple trees were drying. And when I visited, uh, some of these were having uh, these blackened structures. And when you look at uh, the plant very closely, you see some of these uh, branches or twigs dried out with a lot of uh, pimple-like things. 
and these are basically the first year infection here. Second year, you will see many of these things and probably second or third year, you will have a dieback. <clears throat> so this fungus is uh, uh, widespread. It has a very wide host range and, and can basically take care of uh, uh, the trees in a very quick, uh, uh, basically in one or two years, the plant starts uh, uh, dying back. Uh, pruning, very hard pruning is probably very important. If the branches are showing this stage, it is best to prune them and avoid this problem, which is basically blackening and uh, increasing the problem to this stage. So uh, pruning and application of fungicides is very helpful. Here is what the leaves will uh, look like. Uh, and this is what I'm seeing in my home garden. And this is one of the things that uh, is posted the, uh, on the uh, uh, Ontario website. So it is a frog eye leaf spot in some cases, that is what it is called. And the problem is not very great if you can harvest uh, good fruits, but uh, the fruits get infected as well. And so that is a problem. If you have uh, fruits which are infected and people decide either to leave the fruits on the tree or throw them and not pick them up, then we have the problem next year. So uh, there are no resistant varieties. Pruning is very important. Mummified fruits should not be left on the trees. And in some cases on commercial scale, I suppose chemical thinning can be done uh, so that the a number of fruits uh, not uh, left on the tree itself. There are a lot of fungicides, captan, fulfate, pristine, thyram, almost everyone has, and oxidate uh, will be acceptable as well. It is not in any group, not classified. So uh, it is uh, easily controlled. We'll get into Saskatoon's beautiful crop. Uh, and there are two main diseases. One I will talk about, but I did not see this disease this year uh, in my visits. It is very serious disease on the Saskatoons, infects the berries and makes them uh, non-marketable and I suppose non-edible. Uh, unlike uh, the larvae in the fruits, uh, which you can basically uh, ignore and uh, make milkshake, I think these fruits will not make a good milkshake. So it is a big problem. And <clears throat> disease control, again, uh, when the leaves fall off, it is important to clean it out. Uh, and disease is spread by wind and rain, wet conditions. There are some varieties which have resistance. It is important to have a good air flow to the crop drip irrigation is preferred or sprinklers and it is important to protect the blooms from infection because that is where the fruits will also get uh, infected very easily uh, i will not talk about this but there are different stages uh, of the budding to flowering uh, that is uh, targeted for specific uh, fungicides or for specific uh, uh, timing. So if you can, at a later date, go through this. If you are a uh, Saskatoon grower, it gives a very good uh, time scale for fungicide application. I will not go into the details. But important thing is no fungicide or pesticide so as not to affect the pollinators at this stage. And <clears throat> some of you may have seen uh, beautiful uh, fruiting bodies on a uh, Saskatoon fruit. These are the rust uh, Asia and this is what I see in our fruit orchard in uh, Portage but uh, this picture is really heavily infested uh, and this is from uh, British Columbia. I would not show you uh, some bad pictures from our yards. Anyway this disease uh, goes onto the junipers so the uh, junipers 
start the inoculum and goes on to affect the Saskatoons. They grow, they produce uh, these uh, uh, spore producing masses and then infects the junipers again. So it's a cycle here. Uh, there are some good uh, uh, fungicides, uh, that is propiconazole, uh, till topaz, jays, and the uh, triforin is the fungisex, funginex that can be used uh, also. Last few slides. Uh, this is what uh, the grape downy mildew looks like. Uh, I had infection in my uh, grape uh, vines at home and I have just uh, sprayed them so the disease does not spread. This is a picture from one of the colonies and here there are two issues. One is appearing to be a uh, herbicide uh, issue and we could not determine what the uh, herbicide was. It sort of looks like a group board, like 24D and CPA, but uh, they look uh, different, not cupping like this. And here is the downy mildew. And it is a uh, wine which was uh, not thinned and so is going to be not good for this uh, crop. And this is uh, in one of the uh, farms that uh, we had uh, seen everything was lost. There are a lot of fungicides available, so why not use a fungicide? Most farms will have at least two or three of these fungicides. I want to uh, uh, talk about uh, the phos acid fungicide. It is one of the best that I have seen to work on the grapes, potatoes, strawberries, tomatoes, and it will take care of the downy mildews Glade blight and fight off the rots. It will have control of a few other things, but for downy mildew, phos acid fungicides, phosphol, confined, or rampart, they are magic. They are systemic and low risk of resistance development. So if you don't have it, uh, it's a good idea to look into it. Now, uh, ending, I would say general control strategies at the end of a crop season prune out all the old uh, crop residue clear it out and put fungicide if the uh, crop had a lot of uh, fungal problems and at the beginning of the next season before bud break you can use crop oil and lime sulfur especially avoid it when it is hot and Always, always read a label. There may be some tips that you will get of when to use it and when not to use it. This is uh, a label for the landscape oil. It is a good insecticide. Uh, and mineral oil is uh, also effective against aphids and used on potatoes as well. And lime sulfur is very good against uh, mites and thrips scale insects, and also fungal infections on the raspberries. So another good product to have on the farm. And uh, when you're uh, doing the U pick, please make sure that you turn around the berries before you pop them into your mouth. It will not kill you, but you will get more protein. And some people are thinking of having an independent controlled uh, harvesting vehicle. I suppose uh, some of us would love to have it, especially when you have a big farm. So have a great season and uh, maybe try new ways of uh, producing berries. Thank you. Hi, Vikram. I do have uh, one question here for you, if you'd like to just leave your presentation up for a moment. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you suggest to remove crop residue, for example, strawberries from the field? Okay, uh, that is uh, something that uh, Anthony can also chime in. But uh, for uh, renovation, many of the growers would uh, take a cultivator uh, between the rows and then they will be able to collect the hay and also the chopped tops, which are about two, three inches uh, chopped from the top, and then they will 
basically incorporate into the ground. And so one of the best ways is to do that. Uh, some people may think of uh, other ways like vacuuming, but you can't vacuum that much. So incorporating into the soil is one of the best ways. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions uh, right now, so I guess I can turn it back over to you, Tom. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lori. Uh, if any of you have any questions, uh, while well, I'm just wrapping up here and you're a fast typist, you could uh, enter them in there and Lori can pass them on to either Anthony or Vikram. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining uh, today's webinar. There are uh, three uh, webinars remaining in the series. The next webinar in the series on vegetable crop production will be Thursday, August 13th at uh, 1.30. Um, for those of you that are uh, CCAs and would like to receive CCA credits, you can uh, request those credits through, via email to uh, Tracy Cummer. And her email is uh, on the screen there right now, T-R-A-C-E-Y dot C-U-M-M-E-R at G-O-V dot M-B dot C-A. So if you are a CCA and are looking to uh, have any or looking to get credit, for this uh, webinar, please email Tracy. Any uh, additional questions, Lori? Uh, no, but I did have one comment that said, thank you very much, lots of great information. All oh, right on, good to hear. Okay, well, okay. Uh, on behalf of- uh, Can I put a comment today? here? Pardon me? Tom, can I put a comment here? I wonder if uh, some of these fruit growers who see some issues related to either fertility production or disease and insects, you please call us and we will visit you. Good point. So uh, yeah, if you have uh, anything that's uh, baffling uh, you as a grower, uh, feel free to uh, contact Vikram. And Anthony okay. also. Yeah, for sure. One so, more comment. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, one person had asked if it's being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded, and I will send a link out to uh, the recording as soon as it is completed. Well, thank you very much for working behind the scenes, Laurie. I appreciate that today. Um, and again, thank you uh, to the uh, people who dialed up the webinar today. and. Uh, have a great day, and we'll uh, hopefully see you on the 13th of August. Thank you. Thank you.